Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our reading of The Black Arrow. Today's chapter, The Battle of Shoreby. Let's get started. The whole distance to be crossed was not above a quarter of a mile, but they had no sooner debouched beyond the cover of the trees than they were aware of people fleeing and screaming in the snowy meadows upon either hand. Almost at the same moment, a great rumor began to arise and spread and grow continually louder in the town, and they were not yet halfway to the nearest house before the bells began to ring backward from the steeple. The young duke ground his teeth together. By these so early signals of alarm, he feared to find his enemies prepared, and if he failed to gain a footing in the town, he knew that his small party would soon be broken and exterminated in the open. In the town, however, the Lancastrians were far from being in so good a posture. It was as Dick had said. The night guard had already doffed their harness, the rest were still hanging, unlatched, unbraced, all unprepared for battle, about their quarters. And in the hall of Shoreby, there were not perhaps fifty men full armed, or fifty chargers ready to be mounted. The beating of the bounds, the terrifying summons of men who ran about the streets crying and beating upon the doors, aroused in an incredibly short space at least two score out of that half hundred. These got speedily to horse, and the alarm, still flying wild and contrary, galloped in different directions. Thus it befell that when Richard of Gloucester reached the first house of Shoreby, he was met in the mouth of the street by a mere handful of lances, whom he swept before his onset as the storm chases the lark. A hundred paces into the town, Dick Shelton touched the Duke's arm. The Duke, in answer, gathered his reins, put the shrill trumpet to his mouth, and blowing a concerted point, turned to the right hand out of the direct advance. Swerving like a single rider, his whole command turned after him, and still at the full gallop of the chargers, swept up the narrow by streets. Only the last score of riders drew rein and faced about in the entrance. The footmen, whom they carried behind them, leapt at the same instant to the earth and began some to bend their bows, and others to break into and secure the houses upon either hand. Surprised at this sudden change of direction, and daunted by the firm front of the rear guard, the few Lancastrians, after a momentary consultation, turned and rode farther into town to seek for reinforcements. The quarter of the town, upon which, by the advice of Dick, Richard of Gloucester had now seized, consisted of five small streets of poor and ill-inhabited houses, occupying a very gentle eminence, and lying open towards the back. The five streets, being each secured by a good guard, the reserve would thus occupy the centre out of shot, and yet ready to carry aid, wherever it was needed. Such was the poorness of the neighborhood that none of the Lancastrian lords, and but few of their retainers, had been lodged therein, and the inhabitants with one accord deserted their houses and fled squalling along the streets or over garden walls. In the center, where the five rays all met, a somewhat ill-favored alehouse displayed the sign of the checkers, and here the Duke of Gloucester chose his headquarters for the day. 
To deck, he assigned the guard of one of the five streets. Go, he said, win your spurs, win glory for me, one Richard for another. I tell you, if I rise, ye shall rise from the same ladder. Go, he added, shaking him by the hand. But as soon as Dick was gone, he turned to a little shabby archer at his elbow. Go, Dutton, and that right speedily, he added. Follow that lad. If you find him faithful, he answer for his safety, a head for a head. Woe unto you if ye return without him. But if he be faithless, or for one instant ye misdoubt him, stab him from behind. In the meanwhile, Dick hastened to secure his post. The street he had to guard was very narrow, and closely lined with houses, which projected and overhung the roadway. But narrow and dark as it was, since it opened upon the marketplace of the town, the main issue of the battle would probably fall to be decided on that spot. The marketplace was full of townspeople, fleeing in disorder, but there was as yet no sign of any foemen ready to attack, and Dick judged he had some time before him to make ready his defense. The two houses at the end stood deserted with open doors, as the inhabitants had left them in their flight, and from there he had the furniture hastily tossed forth and piled into a barrier in the entry of the lane. A hundred men were placed at his disposal, and of these he threw the more part into the houses, where they might lie in shelter and deliver their arrows from the windows. With the rest, under his own immediate eye, he lined the barricade. Meanwhile, the utmost uproar and confusion had continued to prevail throughout the town, and what with the hurried clashing of bounds, the sounding of trumpets, the swift movement of bodies of horse, the cries of the commanders and shrieks of women, the noise was almost deafening to the ear. Presently, little by little, the tumult began to subside, and soon after, files of men and armor and bodies of Archers began to assemble and form and line for battle in the marketplace. A large portion of this body were in Murray, in blue, and in the mounted knight who ordered their array, Dick recognized Sir Daniel Brackley. Then there befell a long pause, which was followed by the almost simultaneous sounding of four trumpets from four different quarters of the town. A fifth rang in answer from the marketplace, and at the same moment the files began to move and a shower of arrows rattled about the barricade, and sounded like blows upon the walls of the two flanking houses. The attack had begun by a common signal, on all the five issues of the quarter. Gloucester had beleaguered upon every side, and Dick judged if he would make good his post. He must rely entirely on the hundred men of his command. Seven volleys of arrows followed one upon the other, and in the very thick of the discharges, Dick was touched from behind upon the arm, and found a page holding out to him a leathern jack, strengthened with bright plates of mail. It is from my lord of Gloucester, said the page. He hath observed, Sir Richard, that ye went unarmed. Dick, with a glow at his heart at being so addressed, got to his feet and, with the assistance of the page, donned the defensive coat. Even as he did so, two arrows rattled harmlessly upon the plates, and a third struck down the page, mortally wounded at his feet.
Meantime, the whole body of the enemy had been steadily drawing nearer across the market place. And by this time, were so close at hand that Dick gave the order to return their shot. Immediately from behind the barrier and from the windows of the houses, a counterblast of arrows sped, carrying death. But the Lancastrians, as if they had but waited for a signal, shouted loudly an answer, and began to close at a run upon the barrier, the horsemen still hanging back with visors lowered. Then followed an obstinate and deadly struggle hand to hand. The assailants, wielding their falchions with one hand, strove with the other to drag down the structure of the barricade. On the other side, the parts were reversed, and the defenders exposed themselves like madmen to protect their rampart. So for some minutes, the contest raged almost in silence, friend and foe falling one upon another. But it is always easier to destroy, and when a single note upon the tucket recalled the attacking party from this desperate service, much of the barricade had been removed, piecemeal, and the whole fabric had sunk to half its height and tottered to a general fall. And now the footmen in the marketplace fell back at a run on every side. The horsemen, who had been standing in a line too deep, reeled suddenly and made their flank into their front, and as swift as a striking adder, the long steel-clad column was launched upon the ruinous barricade. Of the first two horsemen, one fell, rider and steed, and was ridden down by his companions. The second leaped clean upon the summit of the rampart, transpiercing an archer with his lance. Almost in the same instant, he was dragged from the saddle, and his horse dispatched. And then the full rage and impetus of the charge burst upon and scattered the defenders, the men-at-arms surmounting their fallen comrades, and carried onward by the fury of their onslaught, dashed through Dick's broken line and poured thundering up the lane beyond as a stream the strides and pours across a broken dam. Yet was the fight not over. Still in the narrow jaws of the entrance, Dick and a few survivors plied their bounds like woodmen and already across the width of the passage there had been formed a second, a higher and a more effectual rampart of fallen men and disemboweled horses, lashing in the agonies of death. Half owned by this fresh obstacle, the remainder of the cavalry fell back, and as at the sight of this movement, the flight of arrows redoubled from the casements of the houses. The retreat had, for a moment, almost degenerated into flight. Almost at the same time, those who had crossed the barricade and charged farther up the street, being met before the door of the checkers by the formidable hunchback, the home reserve of the Yorkists, began to come scattering backward in the excess of disarray and terror. Dick and his fellows faced about fresh men poured out of the houses. A cruel blast of arrows met the fugitives full in the face, while Gloucester was already riding down their rear. On the inside of a minute and a half, there was no living than Castrian in the street. Then, and not till then, did Dick hold up his reeking blade and give the word to cheer. Meanwhile, Gloucester dismounted from his horse and came forward to inspect the post. His face was as pale as linen, 
but his eyes shone in his head like some strange jewel, and his voice, when he spoke, was hoarse and broken with the exultation of battle and success. He looked at the rampart, which neither friend nor foe could now approach without precaution. So fiercely did the horses struggle in the throes of death, and at the sight of the great carnage, he smiled upon one side. Dispatch these horses, he said. They keep you from your vantage. Richard Shelton, he added, ye have pleased me. Kneel. The Lancastrians had already resumed their archery, and the shafts fell thick in the mouth of the street. But the Duke, minding them not at all, deliberately drew his sword and dubbed Richard a knight upon the spot. And now, Sir Richard, he continued, if that ye see Lord Risingham send me an express upon the instant, were it your last man, let me hear of it incontinently. I had rather venture the post than lose my stroke at him. For mark me, all of ye, he added, raising his voice, if Earl Risingham fall by another hand than mine, I shall count this victory a defeat. My lord duke, said one of his attendants, is your grace not wary of exposing his dear life unneedfully? Why tarry we here? Catesby, returned the duke, here is the battle, not elsewhere. The rest are but feigned onslaughts. Here must we vanquish, and for the exposure... If ye were an ugly hunchback and the children kicked at you upon the street, ye would count your body cheaper and an hour of glory worth a life. How be it if ye will? Let us ride on and visit the other posts. Sir Richard, hear my namesake. Ye shall still hold this entry, where he wadeth to the ankles in hot blood. Him can we trust, but mark it, Sir Richard. Ye are not yet done. The worst is yet to ward. Sleep not. He came right up to young Shelton, looking him hard in the eyes, and taking his hand in both of his, gave it so extreme a squeeze that the blood had nearly spurted. Dick crowed before his eyes. The insane excitement, the courage, and the cruelty that he read therein filled him with dismay about the future. This young duke's was indeed a gallant spirit to ride foremost in the ranks of war, but after the battle, in the days of peace, then the circle of his trusted friends, that mind it was to be dreaded would continue to bring forth the fruits of death. And that would be all for today. I'll see you all next time. See ya!